Chapters thirty one to thirty three of Rasselas, Prince of Abyssinia. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Giessen. Rasselas, Prince of Abyssinia by Samuel Johnson. Chapter thirty one. They visit the pyramids. The resolution being thus taken, they set out the next day. They laid tents upon their camels, being resolved to stay among the pyramids till their curiosity was fully satisfied. They travelled gently, turned aside to everything remarkable, stopped from time to time, and conversed with the inhabitants and observed the various appearances of towns ruined and inhabited, of wild and cultivated nature. When they came to the Great Pyramid, they were astonished at the extent of the base and the height of the top. Imlac explained to them the principles upon which the pyramidal form was chosen for a fabric intended to coextend its duration with that of the world. He showed that its gradual diminution gave it such stability as defeated all the common attacks of the elements, and could scarcely be overthrown by earthquakes themselves the least resistible of natural violence. A concussion that should shatter the pyramid would threaten the dissolution of the continent. They measured all its dimensions, and pitched their tents at its foot. Next day they prepared to enter its interior apartments, and having hired the common guides, climbed up to the first passage when the favourite of the princess, looking into the cavity, stepped back and trembled. Pekua, said the princess, of what art thou afraid? Of the narrow entrance, answered the lady, and of the dreadful gloom. I dare not enter a place which must surely be inhabited by unquiet souls. The original possessors of these dreadful vaults will start up before us, and perhaps shut us in for ever." She spoke, and threw her arms round the neck of her mistress. "'If all your fear be of apparitions,' said the prince, "'I will promise you safety. There is no danger from the dead. He that is once buried will be seen no more that the dead are seen no more said imlac i will not undertake to maintain against the concurrent and unvaried testimony of all ages and of all nations there is no people rude or learned among whom apparitions of the dead are not related and believed this opinion which perhaps prevails as far as human nature is diffused could become universal only by its truth. Those that never heard of one another would not have agreed in a tale which nothing but experience can make credible. That it is doubted by single cavillers can very little weaken the general evidence, and some who deny it with their tongues confess it by their fears. Yet I do not mean to add new terrors to those which have already seized upon Pekua. There can be no reason why spectres should haunt the pyramid more than other places, or why they should have power or will to hurt innocence and purity. Our entrance is no violation of their privileges. We can take nothing from them. How then can we offend them? my dear pekua said the princess i will always go before you and imlac shall follow you remember that you are the companion of the princess of abyssinia if the princess is pleased that her servant should die returned the lady let her command some death less dreadful than enclosure in this horrid cavern 
you know i dare not disobey you i must go if you command me but if i once enter i shall never come back the princess saw that her fear was too strong for expostulation or reproof and embracing her told her that she should stay in the tent till their return Pekua was not yet satisfied but entreated the princess not to pursue so dreadful a purpose as that of entering the recesses of the pyramids though i cannot teach courage said nikaya i must not learn cowardice nor leave at last undone what i came hither only to do chapter thirty two they enter the pyramid pekua descended to the tents and the rest entered the pyramid they passed through the galleries surveyed the vaults of marble and examined the chest in which the body of the founder is supposed to have been deposited they then sat down in one of the most spacious chambers to rest awhile before they attempted to return we have now said imlac gratified our minds with an exact view of the greatest work of man except the wall of china of the wall it is very easy to assign the motive it secured a wealthy and timorous nation from the incursions of barbarians whose unskilfulness in the arts made it easier for them to supply their wants by rapine than by industry and who from time to time poured in upon the inhabitants of peaceful commerce as vultures descend upon domestic fowl their celerity and fierceness made the wall necessary and their ignorance made it efficacious but for the pyramids no reason has ever been given adequate to the cost and labour of the work the narrowness of the chambers proves that it could afford no retreat from enemies and treasures might have been reposited at far less expense with equal security it seems to have been erected only in compliance with that hunger of imagination which preys incessantly upon life and must always be appeased by some employment those who have already all that they can enjoy must enlarge their desires he that has built for use till use is supplied must begin to build for vanity and extend his plan to the utmost power of human performance that he may not be soon reduced to form another wish i consider this mighty structure as a monument of the insufficiency of human enjoyments a king whose power is unlimited and whose treasures surmount all real and imaginary wants is compelled to solace by the erection of a pyramid the satiety of dominion and tastelessness of pleasures and to amuse the tediousness of declining life by seeing thousands labouring without end and one stone for no purpose laid upon another whoever thou art that not content with a moderate condition imaginest happiness in royal magnificence and dreamest that command or riches can feed the appetite of novelty with perpetual gratifications survey the pyramids and confess thy folly chapter thirty three the princess meets with an unexpected misfortune they rose up and returned through the cavity at which they had entered and the princess prepared for her favourite a long narrative of dark labyrinths and costly rooms and of the different impressions which the varieties of the way had made upon her but when they came to their train they found every one silent and dejected 
the men discovered shame and fear in their countenances and the women were weeping in their tents what had happened they did not try to conjecture but immediately inquired you had scarcely entered into the pyramid said one of the attendants when a troop of arabs rushed upon us we were too few to resist them and too slow to escape they were about to search the tents set us on our camels and drive us along before them when the approach of some turkish horsemen put them to flight but they seized the lady pekua with her two maids and carried them away the turks are now pursuing them by our instigation but i fear they will not be able to overtake them the princess was overpowered with surprise and grief rasselas in the first heat of his resentment ordered his servants to follow him and prepared to pursue the robbers with his sabre in his hand sir said imlac what can you hope from violence or valour the arabs are mounted on horses trained to battle and retreat we have only beasts of burden by leaving our present station we may lose the princess but cannot hope to regain pekua in a short time the turks returned having not been able to reach the enemy the princess burst out into new lamentations and rasselas could scarcely forbear to reproach them with cowardice but imlac was of opinion that the escape of the arabs was no addition to their misfortune for perhaps they would have killed their captives rather than have resigned them end of chapter thirty three Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey